Hi, everybody. That's uh, a real pleasure to uh, have you uh, uh, kindly coming to Hong Kong in spite of the difficulties for uh, traveling. Uh, and uh, we'll just have uh, something like one or two hours of uh, quarantine uh, in order to talk about uh, what uh, uh, is uh, interests us uh, in the MySpaces project. So uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, symposium, if we can call it that way, uh, could say seminar, uh, is uh, more about uh, sharing some of our findings uh, related to the Mindspaces European project, part uh, of the Stars Lighthouse uh, program, uh, where we have uh, at the same time research, artists, artworks, and uh, we have been starting this project uh, now uh, one, uh, one year and a half ago, a bit more. And uh, yeah, I may say a few words about the Mindspaces project, but of course we can see the full description online, so it shouldn't be a, it shouldn't be a problem. Uh, the the Mindspaces project is a collaborative project that has been initiated by uh, by CERT uh, in uh, uh, in Greece uh, and by different teams uh, uh, in Europe. So now we have something like twelve different partners. Many of yours of the partners are present today and also some uh, artists in residence. And uh, I, uh, of course, I thought it would be interesting to address one of the questions uh, of the project. So the particularity of the Start uh, Like House project is to see how art can inspire research and more specifically for mind spaces is how art can inspire, uh, for example, the, the architecture and interior design. So how this relation can be built and uh, in a specific way. Uh, so the question uh, is how the different kind of sensors, how a complex apparatus of uh, devices. So let me, uh, let me share. Yeah, I should share my slides, of course. So the Mindspaces project is a uh, gather, uh, so something like 12 different partners in Europe, but also partners like, uh, for example, Refi Canada, uh, with uh, at the same time from Turkey, but also living in Los Angeles. And, and uh, uh, personally, I'm at the same time in France when I can, and, and presently in Hong Kong, where I teach at the School of Creative Media. Uh, so that's these different exchanges on the project led to uh, interpreting uh, the uh, the potential of the art, the artistic presence in research project. And uh, then we have uh, a C by uh, May. I forgot one of your E. Did I? Yes. This sorry, sorry. We correct that as soon as possible. Uh, we'll talk about Nerma inside and out. Uh, Alexia uh, will talk about computer vision, helping computers understand how artworks feel. Uh, Louis uh, from McNeil will talk about uh, where uh, Rhinos roam. And Beatrice uh, will talk about what will come to our mind as soon as uh, the other speakers will have talked before. Uh, Nefeli will talk about mind spaces because she is also part of the team who uh, created the project. Uh, Emmanuel uh, will talk about intelligent aesthetics uh, and all reactive interaction between perceiver, perceiver and artwork. Tyson uh, from Zaha Hadid will talk about cognitive agent. As you can see, I won't repeat the title you can read. Alejandro Mindspaces creating social impact by art thinking. Uh, Anastasio's uh, city as artwork, and this is what we are talking about. And Despoina uh, Zavarka will talk about sensing stillness, stillness, sorry, from landscape to art. So uh, I just would like to say a few words about this title. Uh, of course, the Mindspaces project uh, uh, as a kind of uh, as something special compared to other projects trying to establish 
connection between art and science and research. The specificity is a focus on the idea that either the city or the artwork should have some receptive properties, should have a sentience as a, a, it's become, becoming trendy to call it. And uh, I think it's a, one of the major evolution of these uh, last years uh, that uh, we have work that first could work, could evolve in real time, then start feeling something around them. This evolution has been interesting because after uh, that it became possible to have artworks uh, that renew themselves, evolve in real time and renew themselves uh, thanks to the capacity of the computers. Uh, and so have th this made possible the fact to interact, but interact means uh, receiving, perceiving something in the environment. And this perception modified uh, as uh, uh, it was uh, proposed or suggested by Condillac uh, in the, uh, in the uh, 18th century, uh, that suggested that if we give the, uh, the possibility of smell, to a statue, the statue will start thinking and, and uh, having emotions and so on. So the idea that the perception of the environment and the perception of the spectator for an artworks and, uh, and, the perception, and the perception of the people in the environment, all these relations modify, uh, modify our relation to the world. Uh, increasing the capacity of the world to react uh, in a complex way uh, with behaviors that are maybe more or less similar to human or animal behaviors and enrich our relation to uh, our relation to this environment and to the people. This has, a, of course, a strong impact uh, on artworks uh, because artworks suddenly are not anymore kind of uh, a final perfect composition of elements that has been uh, put together by the artist uh, to uh, complete uh, uh, the, the masterpiece. It has become part of a complex process that is not necessarily a communication process, but can be a revelation process, something that is happening uh, as a form of serendipity applied to, to art. And what is happening is a, a process of, uh, uh, I say, revelation, because it's, uh, this is how the sense emerge from the work. And this is what, uh, what we would like to uh, take into consideration. So how this perception of the artist can inspire research in the field of architecture and, 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 uh, uh, and interior design, this is what we'll see with the different uh, talks we have now, very soon. So uh, just uh, so I already, uh, uh, so I, I wanted to remind you about uh, the, this illustration of the tool that we are building with a lot of uh, different skills and, uh, and how our partners are introducing things that go from, from camera, wind, wind perception, television, uh, mechanics, uh, thermometer, uh, animometer, uh, EEG sensors, and all these things together. Of course, we wouldn't like this to become the Swiss Army knife uh, with 100 or 200 blades and, and features, uh, but we uh, wanted to allow artists at least thinking about how this, the, the potential of perception of uh, what we used to know as static element of our reality, uh, modify uh, the art of making sense. And this is what uh, what we are uh, fighting for. So uh, just a few words, if, uh, if Refik comes after, he will talk about many things around that. Uh, on, uh, on September 9th, uh, so the Arts Electronica Festival will start at uh, 10, at 10 o'clock and at 10.15, we'll have a, a conversation uh, with uh, Refik uh, during 43 minutes. Uh, around this, uh, this project that we have developed for Mind Spaces, which is called Dialogue. And it's a project to two art worlds try to understand each other. So it's a, for the public space, 
the interaction is between artworks, but also between art, uh, artworks and their environments. So the artworks become like aliens, immigrants that are stranger where they, where they arrive, where they land, but then try to understand what's happening around and they modify progressively, gradually, they modify their behavior and, and they, they enrich each other that way. We'll see that they can have memories, they can have, uh, uh, they can discover, build new, uh, new element of memories uh, and they start understanding the language uh, in all the sense of the term of the population, the local population. And so during the Ars Electronica, Ars Electronica Festival, uh, we'll have also in real time, the presence 24 seven of uh, uh, what uh, we call alien life in the telescope, which is the two, let's say, two prototypes of the aliens that are not yet together. So they don't try yet to understand each other, but they are here and they live already as if we would observe them from another planet or under a microscope. So I stop sharing, so you, uh, I would like to. Yeah, thanks very much for the invitation. I uh, appreciate that. Um, just following in uh, Maurice's invitation to discuss uh, on the topic of how uh, artworks feel, uh, I'd just like to give my, my own response. Um, I think for me, um, it's a, uh, what, I think that there's an increasing drive that technology will allow us or enable us the possibility to uh, know um, what, what an artwork or an object um, can feel, which is out of uh, kind of the same desire to know what somebody else might feel. And somehow we can extend our senses and intuitions uh, through sensors through various kind of input data that then kind of turn into qualitative information. Um, but I, I do think that this is out of, um, that this desire that we have that uh, we hope to enable with technology is born out of uh, an anxiety that uh, there isn't the possibility uh, to know how, how things feel, uh, what, what the experience of any, um, of what any object is nor can we know even what the experience of anyone else is, in fact. And I think for me as an artist, this is what's really sort of uh, the quintessential kind of um, uh, um, c scenario that I try to deal with when I'm, when I'm conceiving of an artwork or an installation. Like what we see here is a large scale installation that I produced, which is a, a wind tunnel, which is creating um, a wind using sound. And this is something meant to be experienced um, uh, while you're inside of it. But at the same time, there's no way that I can know what people will actually experience within this tunnel. Um, what I'd really like to do is to shape a certain possibility, but I, I actually can't be sure. And for me, um, uh, this attempt to kind of divide uh, or try to bring together the subject and the object, uh, the experience of the artwork and the intention of the creator. Um, Asib, uh, I think your, well, your screen is black at the moment. I'm not sure if you have an image up just to double check. Uh, yeah, there should be an image. Yeah. There you go. Uh, there you go. Now it's up. Oh, okay. It was in full screen mode. <laughs> Sorry <laughs> I about thought that. that would give you a full. Great. Uh, okay. So yeah, here's the, here's the image that I was just describing. Yeah, for me, for me, the point is that there's no way that we can know uh, what anybody else is going to experience uh, of an artwork, but we can try to create an experience for people. And for me, an artwork is important in that it's the most intentional, uh, it's the thing that's created with the most degree of intentionality to try to shape an experience, to try to communicate with another person, to try and imbue an object with intentionality and meaning as much as possible. And also, even at this point, it still falls short it's still impossible actually to know what the artwork is feeling, what whoever this visitor might be that will experience this artwork at some point in the future, we can't know what they will actually experience. So there's actually, it, it falls short, it fails in trying to bring together uh, uh, the subject and the object, the present and the future. There's a huge chasm there 
and uh, and that that speaks to the fundamental experience of of us in life that we're not able to uh, really um, have that degree of control, no matter how much capital we invest in these technologies, increasingly so. And it shows to me that more shows that the technology is a form of wish fulfillment. Um, and not that much more. It's not something that carries on its own type of intentionality or its own type of program. It's really a social desire that's being um, enabled uh, through technique, you know, and uh, collective understanding and collective desire to invest that much into it. Um, but it's really important for me that we maintain this, this um, we maintain and we recognize the point at which it's not possible to bring these things together. It's not possible to bring the subject and the object together and what are the limits of that? What are the limits of, of communication? What are the limits of shared experience? What are the uh, limits between me and you and between me and the object? Um, and just like in closing, I think that even in the fundamentals of continental philosophy, uh, Kant really speaks about this beautifully because he, he speaks to um, the difference between the thing and the object. Uh, things are all of the material, um, all of the material that composes our world and our experience. The object uh, is the mental representation or the concept of the thing. So I have like my, this is like a piece of ceramic, which has been shaped into something that looks like a teacup. And I recognize it as a teacup, but that doesn't mean that the thing is a teacup. It just means that, that uh, I recognize it as an object of the teacup, you know. Um, meaning that uh, we're always engaged in a process of cognition in which we have mental concepts that correspond to reality, but they're not the same thing. We just uh, um, hope that we have some degree of adequacy, some degree of, uh, um, of, of uh, accuracy when we engage in this kind of mental projection on the world as individuals and at a broader social level. And I think this is precisely the kind of blurry area that artworks exist in and push the boundaries of and uh and i think that's what's most exciting about artworks is uh not that they will help us to predict everything or to bring everything together into a, a cohesive universe but rather also point to all of the fractures and the cracks and the and the, those are the re, uh, real realms of possibility so yeah thank you for listening <laughs> to my uh, yeah um So any, um, any question or comments uh, you would like to uh, make after a SIP talk? Okay, actually I think we agree uh, on what, we, what you said. Obviously, there is no contradiction apparently. So that means that our level of perception, reaction, behavior, and all these things are compatible in this project. That's good. So the, uh, now, the next uh, speaker is uh, Alexia. Yes, hello. Um... Can you hear me with echo or is this okay? We, we can hear you if you can, if you want to share a screen, you, you, you yep. can do it as well. All right, so I'm gonna talk about how we're trying to understand how artworks feel to people um, by computer vision. So the title of this talk is Helping Computers Understand How Artworks Feel. And uh, first, what is computer vision? It's um, a branch of computer science and in general, not only computer science, that is used in mind spaces to analyze human behaviors in the presence of artworks. So we're trying to see when there is an artwork in a space or a new design concept, um, what is the reaction of people from a high level to more detailed interactions depending on the use case. Uh, this project, both indoors and outdoors environments are gonna be looked at. We're gonna present some outdoors environments uh, and use cases in this uh, presentation. And the goal is ultimately to find maybe individual behaviors or interactions between people and or how crowds behave in the presence of an artwork. So computer vision comprises of algorithms that try to recognize all sorts of things and 
digital visual data like images and videos. And in this project, we're trying to detect humans, activities, interactions between humans and artworks, and maybe even sudden events. And in this specific case in the vicinity of artworks, we're trying to detect and track people to basically see if they're going towards the artwork, the amount and direction of motion near the artwork, how long they stay near the artwork, and uh, if something unexpected happens. Uh, there are some examples, not exactly with artworks, but I'll show you some demos. What we did so far is we have created some synthetic data sets with various environments to try to analyze individual and crowd behaviors to test out our methods and uh, in a wide variety of realistic setups. This includes person detection and tracking, identifying where the people are um, present and how long and if they gather or interact. So if there's a bunch of people around an artwork that are interacting and staying there for a long time, one can assume they're interested in it. So we also try to analyze crowd behavior. These are some screenshots of one of the many synthetically generated data sets that we have made. Um, the first picture shows some feature points. You can see them maybe with little green dots. They show where people are and they help track them. And in the second image, you can see bounding boxes, which is finding where people are to later see where they go. There is also information about depth, which can be useful for more detailed um, analysis of human behaviors and segmentation of the people, which is really detailed and can help really understand what's going on. Here is an example of motion these uh, colored shadows are the amount where people move in various uh, video frames and the direction. And here you can see how it can change later after an event has occurred. Here is a snapshot of an outdoor synthetic environment. On the top right, you can see color maps of the optical flow, which is where people have moved around this um, building. And we do some statistical processing of what's called optical flow and some other features to see when there is a change um, in the behavior of this crowd. So that's kind of technical and I'm not getting into the details about that. Here's another um, environment where people are also outdoors and moving and you can see that the big uh, uh, changes in this and these uh, curves show that people have uh, moved in a different way. And here is a video showing even more detail, well, the whole video. On the top right, you can see the motion. Here you can see what's going on, and here you can see how our statistics change when people move around in an outdoors area. So when many people ran, this curve jumped up. and it jumps again when people leave the scene. Another completely different environment is in a beach and there is a big jump when people evacuate the beach. Here's the video. Sorry. So when people are moving around, there are small jumps, and when something big happens, we see bigger changes in our curve. And when everybody runs away, we find a big change easily. Now, in one of the use cases in Mindspaces, we have uh, recordings in Teclascala, and these are um, snapshots of the area that is recorded by the cameras. The red dots show what is, which areas are being uh, surveyed, and this is a zoom of one of the cameras. And here is a real video where people are detected coming into a scene, arriving. Here they start gathering. So maybe there is an artwork or in theory because this uh, video is without the artwork present, uh, but it is real people who showed up. 
and uh, they start gathering and they seem to hang around in a circle. And eventually, after staying there for a while, they will leave. And this is the whole video. The little black dots here show the area and how people are tracked, so there are trajectories inside the area. This is actually a rather long video where people are staying. So um, what we do in, within the project is record the area you see in, on the left where people are standing and also for how long they're standing there, which again can indicate interest in the, what's going on with the artwork that might be there. And at some point they will eventually leave, but I think it's not shown in this video. So that is a summary of what we're doing. And I'm trying to unshare. Okay. Um, are you done, Alexia? Yeah, I'm trying to. Oh, there it is. Stop sharing. Yep. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't know if you have a question. I have a question for you. Uh, I, I would like you to describe how you imagine the use of your, the technology you're working on. Um, well, the idea of the whole project is to have artworks placed in some environments to inspire design of those environments. And we want to see how people react to them. So like I said, if there is an outdoors, the dialogue set up, it's a really simple, the first concept, will there be people going to look at it? and to find when and how long they're staying there. In an indoors workspace, when there is a new design, we want to see if people will react to it, if there will be increased uh, flow of people there. Something that is interesting for architects is to see if people interact. So we want to eventually determine on a more fine grain level if there's interaction between people. If there is a change in their behavior before and after the presence of the artwork. If it's positive or negative, well, on a very crude basis, if people run away, maybe it's negative, I'm not sure. But uh, overall, we expect that there will be interest in gathering of people. This is done in commerce for the very simple case of, but valuable, of finding if people are interested in shop, when, in, yeah, in storefronts. So there are even products sold that do this but we want to start with a general approach and then analyze in a more fine-grained way what goes on. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, is there any, any other question? Okay, I will play again my role of the anchor man. Uh, and uh, now it's uh, Luis, I guess. Luis Fagada from McNeil. Hello. Hello, Luis. Sure here. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Let me check. Yeah. Yes. 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 Okay. All right, so hello everybody. Uh, my name is Luis Fraguada. I'm a developer at McNeil Europe um, and titled this uh, Where Rhinos Roam because it's more about 
um, you know, how a commercial company that develops software eventually um, starts a R&D department based on some of the research that we're involved in, including the Mindspaces project. So Rhino, if you don't know it, I'll just give you a, a brief overview. It's a 3D modeling software. People use it for all sorts of things, uh, like making shoes or boats or medical equipment, uh, teeth, adult toys, uh, kid toys, cars, buildings, movie sets, landscapes, art, etc. People use it for all sorts of things. Um, Rhino excels at working with non-uniform rational B-spline curves and surfaces. And that provides, a, let's say, a robust way to you know, create geometry um, that also is uh, pretty straightforward to manufacture from the geometric side of things. Um, this is what a little bit of the interface looks like. Uh, if you've ever done any 3D modeling uh, before, you might see a similar interface like this. Uh, another thing that uh, I wanted to mention is that we have a visual programming editor called Grasshopper. This is what you see over on the one side of the screen with all the nodes and things connected to each other. And this really allows anyone to program the logic for the designs uh, with parametric principles using variables and conditions. Uh, this is a uh, Coincidentally, the, the Mac version of Rhino. Uh, it's, we have it for Mac and Windows desktop. And, you know, a grasshopper definition might allow you to do something like this, test different variations of a particular design or a particular artwork. Um, so this has really opened up the possibility for uh, parametric design and, and computational logic um, to pretty much everyone without necessarily needing to know how to, how to do text-based uh, scripting. Or programming. So what do people do with Rhino? Let me show you a few examples here. Um, and this is a project called Galaxia. It's actually the the temple um, at Burning Man in Black Rock City in 2018. And this was done by uh, Arthur Manumani Architects. Um, after many years of actually going to uh, Black Rock City with um, his students and doing different uh, artworks on the playa, uh, Arthur and his team won the, the, I guess, the commission to do the, the temple in 2018. This was all designed and uh, produced uh, in, in Rhino, all the, not only the the design of it, but also the structural uh, analysis of it and the documentation of the project. Um, we have a lot of users that use this for um, very traditional art mediums. Here, uh, Rinos Roloff's um, explores mathematical structures and eventually creates sculptures out of them, um, develops it all within Rhino. Somehow, interestingly, uh, the Sagrada Familia, the technical office of the Sagrada Familia, um, uses Rhino and Grasshopper to continue to develop uh, the works at uh, Sagrada Familia. Um, so even though it's been going for, I don't know, what is it, 100 and some years, the construction, um, they still look for new tools and new ways of developing um, the project. So it's used in this. Um, but really, as a commercial entity, we have somewhat limited ways of actually collaborating with our users. Um, so we're always asking ourselves, how else can we get involved uh, besides just, you know, uh, creating new features in the software or fixing some bugs that they might have. Um, we didn't have a really true channel to get involved with uh, the work of our users. And over the years, we've been able to support specific projects, but just really in a, not ever in a manner that we uh, would be considered like partners in the project. Um, so we're getting requests oh, all the time to join uh, EU projects, and we didn't really didn't have experiences for that. So we set up a, kind of an R&D department in, in our office in Barcelona. Um, Verena Vogler and myself uh, already worked for McNeil Europe, and we've grown the team to include um, Costas, uh, Av Zerinakis, who is an AI and machine learning expert, uh, Ayman Mogne, who coordinates a lot of the technical development in the projects, and Stavros Kouras, who's a data scientist focusing on neurological imaging and neurofeedback. So as the projects um, grow, we try to also include people that are experts in the projects to so allow us you know, a little bit uh, more know-how um, in the project to know how best to fit our development tools to that. So we started in October 
2015 with a project called Interchain. And, and today we have two ongoing projects. Importantly, the, the project we're talking about today, which is the Mindspaces project. So what's basically our first objective in the research projects is, is we seek collaboration and making new connections with people, companies, institutions that we might not otherwise have met inside of our 3D modeling and, and programming bubble. Uh, so we've been lucky to meet and work with some incredibly uh, competent people. So um, beyond collaboration, there are other benefits to being involved in such projects. Uh, we get to test Rhino in ways which are very unique and, you know, never thought of uh, for Rhino itself. Each partner in the project brings a new challenge for us. Um, so in Mindspaces alone, we have the incredible opportunity to task Rhino with being part of the interface to so generating 3D spatial scenarios based on behavioral data. And that's, that's pretty cool. Um, up to Metric, who are experts in 3D scanning environments and 3D reconstructions, are challenging Rhino with their amazing and very detailed 3D scans. And so how can our users take advantage of all of that information within the Rhino interface? And that's you know a, a geometric uh, piece of data. So that's, that's a pretty straightforward way for us to enter in. Um, but there's other partners, such as uh, Maastricht University, CERT, UPF, they're providing all sorts of non-geometric data, uh, which we need to somehow interpret and somehow make it relevant in, in a 3D space um, in a spatial domain. And also, you know, Maurice and Rafiq, uh, as technically competent artists, challenged Rhino not just with geometry and data, but also uh, in seeking performance. Uh, so just in this project, there are so many new kinds of inputs that challenge us to think about how Rhino could, um, could use this data. How can it perform better? So I'm just going to mention here where our development sits within kind of the, the, the technical platform of Mindspaces. Uh, so this, we have what's called the, the design tool, which sits in between um, some third party services, uh, VR environment, and a lot of other data inputs. And the main objective of the design tool is to allow to develop experiments where different configurations can eventually be tested in the VR environment. So all of these data inputs are brought into the design tool. Um, uh, an artist or a designer might want to understand how their particular artwork is, affects the users within a space, and then th they can develop those configurations within the design tool. Um, and eventually users and, and, and people who we're bringing into the experiment can experience that in a VR environment where they will be eventually um, you know, with data will be recorded of their experience. Um, so in order to have all this happen, as I mentioned, there's a lot of inputs coming in. So, so we have here um, uh, for one of the use cases, we're actually using the McNeil office as a location. We have cameras tracking movement and activity of the people within the space. And this is uh, CERT and, and especially, you know, Maastricht University, what Alexia was just mentioning, Alexia and Rico's work uh, leads to this data collection and, and processing. Um, as I mentioned before, up to metric um, are experts in 3D reconstruction, and they have this you know, incredible 3D scan of, of, our, of our offices, which that also has to somehow come into uh, the design tool. Um, Zaha Adid uh, Architects, well, Tyson's team has, has also worked to make this model has worked to make this model a little bit more digestible in the, in the design tool. Um, and eventually this passes into the VR tool that NeuroGames is, is developing. And Zahadid Architects also does um, some spatial anal analytics and configurations. So um, all of this stuff has to eventually come into this uh, design tool that is still very much a work in progress. Um, but eventually all this information comes into here. Uh, designers and artists can, can set up different configurations for uh, the experiments and eventually uh, users can, can record their experiences with these different configurations. So yeah, as I mentioned, we're, it's very much in, in work in progress as we really depend on the data from, from all sorts of uh, other places and other services. Uh, but we hope that it can provide a useful interface for artists to develop spatial experiments and get feedback about how their work uh, affects um, how people inhabit spaces. And I just want to finish off with um, this, this, this other sort of be benefit that, that we've seen from participating in projects is that then we can get involved in, in projects that, that we would you know, have never 
thought to be involved in. This is a project that uh, Maurice uh, Maurice initiated with some other partners, and and uh, the, it's called Value of Values. And and here we're we're just a very small part of this huge um, huge piece of work, which attempts to um, let's say give value to to different. Uh, different terms, different, well, I'm sure Maurice could explain it a little better, but uh, all we did here was we took, we took some, um, some data, which came from, um, I have here some, yeah, some, some data arranged from, from EEG, I'll say captured from, from EEG. And eventually all we're doing here is, is uh, making a small little tool to, to reconstruct uh, those points coming from the data collection. And eventually those points eventually make a mesh and this mesh is used um, as a sort of uh, object, as an entity in the value of value project. So even though it's a small part, it's still really interesting for us to, to test uh, Rhino and, and Grasshopper and our development tools on this. So with that, I just wanna say uh, thank you and I hand it back to you, uh, Maurice. Thank you very much, Wait. Uh, any any question or comment? Yeah, Tyson, you want to say something? No, you're fine. No, 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 no addition. I'm gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> make comments in the end. <laughs> okay, good, good, good. Let's see. Great. So. Um, my name is Nefeli Yurgakopoulou and I am a research associate uh, at CERD, uh, which as Maurice already told, is the coordinator of Mind Spaces project. And today I will talk about a more general idea about Mind Spaces and what the, um, the inspiration of Mind Spaces was and is. Um, Mind Spaces is a three-year lighthouse project financed by the European Commission STARTS. Um, as um, most of you might know, the STARTS lighthouse, lighthouse pilots support research seeking novel technology solution to major challenges for industry and society in close collaboration with artists. So in Mind Spaces, um, the collaboration of artists, scientists, architects, engineers, and technology experts was it set up from the very, very first beginning, uh, from the basic idea of the project when we were writing the proposal. And we included two very important artists in our consortium, um, Maurice Benayoun and Rafi Kanaldol, who are working in similar uh, fields as the Mind Spaces concept. Uh, afterwards, we have uh, also included art artists in residency who are trying to combine their unconventional thinking with the empirical and pragmatic perception of the citizens and occupants of spaces in order to increase the well-being of the land. Um, and for that, they have several technologies and data available for mining spaces. So Mind Spaces, in few words, uh, is a multidisciplinary project which monitors, monitors the spatial experience and tries to propose innovative and adaptive designs to address societal challenges, the evolving needs in functionality, and uh, an emotional resonance with our built environment. Uh, our built environment uh, is a complex system with many different parameters and parts that is difficult to take into consideration as a whole when designing a space. Um, Mind Spaces is a, it has two main uh, research uh, directions. The one is to take into account diverse parts and data, connect and integrate them in the design process, and also to propose a new open model of real-time participation of the public in the urban and architectural design. Um, the, now, the whole idea of um, how art and technology collaboration can contribute to innovative process in research, industry, and society, um, which was the call of uh, the starts, uh, the open call of the starts, it's not, of course, something new. Um, there are many examples throughout the past decades towards this goal. But I would like to talk uh, about one particular that uh, has some similarities with Mind Spaces and its research within design. 
so I will go back to the 60s and um, I will talk about uh, Umberto Eco who researched the active role given to the recipient in the realization of an art project and published two very important texts to describe um, how artworks were designed to change and uh, metamorphose over time. Uh, an idea uh, uh, inspired from information theory. Um, so the one uh, text is the open work uh, of Umberto Eco and the other one is uh, The Shape of Disorder who published in the Almanaco Pompiani Publishing House at the same year. Um, so in general, uh, in the open work, uh, Echo explained uh, how works of literature, music and visual arts um, provided the reader, the interpreter or the observer with a role in the realization of the work. In Echo's words, open work invites the participant or performer to make the work together with the author. Um, kinetic art back at, the, at its very beginnings of the 20s, an art form such as Happening Fluxus and Dada appeared later in the 50s, pushed the, this possibility of user involvement to a whole new level. So uh, the question is, what about uh, the idea of openness in architectural, architectural and design process? Is it can be integrated or not? Um, Echo in his book sees the integration between scientific and artistic methods as the ultimate reason for a definition of work into the dialectic that characterizes the contemporary art research. An open work is a work receptive to transformation and able to produce configurations not expected by the artist as determined by external agents. This doesn't mean a total abandonment to randomness, but uh, still the artist or the author as I call um, reverse, create rules. The other, the other text that I co-published the, the same year uh, was together with Bruno Munari and they coined the term Arte Programmata. Uh, at the beginning of the 60s, um, it's interesting because many, many doesn't know the, uh, they, they believe that Echo is a fictional I don't know, writer, but back at then it was a non-fiction editor of the Pompiani Public House in Milan. And he had the task to come up with applications of calculators in the field of art and design. So he presented this application uh, as programming arts, uh, art programmata in an um, and a, and a, and a published book of Almanaco Letterario Pompiani back to 1962. Um, in December 61, um, ECHO, uh, together with Munari, went uh, and invited uh, several artists uh, working over this idea and they asked them to create artworks uh, defined from some kind of rules, something program, in order to include them in that uh, edition. A few months after the publication um, uh, of uh, Almanaco Letterario Pompiani, the Olivetti showroom, the Olivetti is the, um, uh, the company that produced typewriters back then, and they also calculators, and of course they wanted to expand to, to the, the computers. Um, organized uh, the exhibition Arte Programmata, Arte Kinetica, or I would say it in English, Programmar Art, Kinetic Art, Multiplied Works and Open Works. Um, so, um, Echo's idea of the open work was based on his argument that society, uh, at, at that, uh, back then, uh, was entering a new age with uh, social conventions and linguistic codes that altered uh, constantly. Um, uh, Olivetti uh, wanted to contribute to that innovation of society and culture. Um, and um, that's why he uh, asked uh, ar artists to involve in uh, the design of their products, uh, their advertisement and everything. 
So to me, this is very close to what Mindspace is trying to do and what the, the call of the start is. That's why I'm telling you this story. Um, and uh, all the artists who participated to that exhibition created the artworks that could provide a platform for social engagement, a way to methodic methodically move from engaging a formal program to collectively creating a social one. So in view of the above, it is deducted that in order to promote the concept of openness within architecture and give to the designing process adaptive and evolving capacity, we should redefine the methodology so to give rise to open system of relations rather than solutions unable to absorb the transformation of the environment in which they are inserted. And for that, uh, the artist and the inspiration from art, several art movements can also help. Um, in mind spaces, the architect, the designer, the artist, the author, as the authors, as Echo was referring, uh, together with scientists and technology experts, invite the public to involve in the challenges of our society, uh, the challenges that our society is facing, and uh, feel or even talk with spaces, which will then adapt according to their emotional response or other uh, inputs. Uh, the platform developed within Mindspaces will produce the possibility to dynamically adapt spaces, installations, objects based on sensors, feedback, and new ideas that will occur during the design process, offering an innovative and flexible tools with multiple applications. Um, okay, I will try to talk very fast a bit about Mindspaces technology that we're creating in CERT, maybe one particular. Um, um, so in mind spaces, we have several pieces of information. Um, uh, and inputs uh, of varying nature. So we try to move forward from a chaotic information to structured data. Um, but the multimodal variety problem still pertains. And the question is how um, can someone come to a design decision or conclusion, but somehow combining, um, for example, a, trendy, a relevant trending tweet post with a person uh, captured by a CCTV camera, or how the behavior of an employee in an office space may be connected with materials, with the materials of the space. So in mind spaces uh, here in CERT, we develop uh, an ont ontological model to facilitate this uh, uh, connection, this interlinking. What is this technology is doing is to place every single parameter and inputs and interconnected graph patterns. These interconnections may even produce additional knowledge undetected from the human eye. Ontologies are an attempt to represent entities, ideas, and events with all of their independent properties and relations according to a system of ca categories. Through this platform, um, the author takes into consideration these relations, set up a number of different rules, uh, which have already been organized with specifications, and the user can um, complete the work through his uh, emotional response. So the logic behind this rule-based reasoning is to fuse knowledge incoming from all this data, the different data, and uh, assert which design uh, configuration is the most appropriate to be forward in a VR uh, environment uh, where the user is ex which the user is experienced and um, respond and respond uh, to its emotional state. Um, so here is where um, the participant comes into play and. Um, uh, his role in the designing process uh, of spaces. Um, the artists of uh, our team uh, can also use any of these data collected and services mind spaces provide and create artworks that make the new scientific paradigm seem normal by expressing it in culture as Echo has written. Um, I will not go further uh, to the other technologies. Um, just to mention, 
uh, uh, but we are creating an emo emotional analysis service and uh, an aesthetic and style extraction from visual content. I would not like to go further to that. So thank you. Thank you, Nefeli. Uh, it was uh, actually important to have uh, this uh, detail on how the, the Mindspaces project works. And, uh, um, I don't know if there are comments or additional information you would like to bring. Mm -hmm. Seems to be okay. Thank you very much, Nefeli. Uh, so uh, now we have Emmanuel, I think it's your turn. Okay. Yeah, hello, my name is Emmanuel Golob. I'm based in Vienna, Austria, and artist in residence at Mindspaces. And today I'm going to present around the title of Intelligent Aesthetics a New Reactive Interaction Between Perceiver and Artwork. When I'm talking about aesthetics, I'm not meaning the search for the beauty or the ugly, but rather about the perceivable of an artwork. Uh, yeah, here a picture of mine in front of my artwork, so you know who is talking. Mm, and then I want to start with this project I did in 2017. It was called Robot Doing Nothing. And it was a robotic art installation with where the robot was uh, moving elastic strings. And I tried to create this moment or feeling of doing nothing for the visitors. But when talking with the visitors and also perceiving how my artwork is perceived, I realized that um, I didn't achieve what I wanted. That for some people it was working, for some visitors it was definitely not. And then I was asking myself the question if I, I as an artist rather would like to define an artwork very precise in its physical appearance and maybe also on other layers or if I would actually prefer to do art which, is, which communicates in the emotion um, which arrives at the visitor. So I started to look into and aesthetic research and what kind of models or components are essential in the aesthetic perception and cognition process. And there are several around like memory, context, domain specific expertise and some others and as well as social interaction discourse. And I was thinking that when doing my art, I have a concept and I want to draw attention to it, but I want to draw attention do it by creating a specific emotion, feeling, or having defining what arrives at the visitor to have a more precise discourse. So I was thinking to rather make the object of interest in the beginning dynamic or in the flux, or maybe also intelligently and learning to adapt and always try to achieve a nearly similar aesthetic emotion which in, in reality turns out to be not feasible and the output might be something else, but that's, that's the approach how I, I went into the process. So the first project I did in this direction was called Doing Nothing with AI. And it was a robotic sculpture, like an animated sculpture, and it was, a, a generative adversarial network and an AI was generating the choreography of the sculpture and the visitor was perceiving and I and the sculpture was using an EEG headset to measure if the person is getting closer to this doing nothing state I was aiming on or not and then in the background the artificial intelligence was learning how it could improve the choreography or how it could, which choreography it's going to generate in the next step. So somehow I created an aesthetic experience in the flux and it was not that I'm creating like an optimized artwork, but it's more that I'm creating this kind of non-hierarchical interaction between the viewer and the, and the artwork. And you could say it's some kind of effect loop where the, 
the receiver is affected by the artwork, but the artwork is also affected by the receiver. Um, to give you an impression of what it was looking like. So in theory, the So in theory, the space of possible aesthetics were, was really large, but what I experienced is that we, with our human perception and most of us not trained in um, like seeing or perceiving motions in a, in a very uh, small parameter difference, it was very hard to see the difference between small parameter changes. So we only, or I only perceived changes with, uh, with large parameter differences. But it worked somehow that this interaction created um, something like another experience, yes. Um, looking uh, behind the facade, this is the artificial intelligence or generative network I'm using. So the generator generates a choreography, it's executed, the perceiver perceives it, the EG feedback is measured, and then it trains again the network. So with the next artwork I did, which is called Doing Nothing with AI 2.0, I wanted to more go towards a spatial feeling, but also to extend the space of possibilities with a generative um, Visuals by Connie Tank, as well as Generative Soundscape by Veronica Meyer. And this made it way easier for the visitors to perceive the interaction and also because um, the artwork as well as the perceiver were nearly the same height and the visitor were allowed to walk around. It created a very like intimate dialogue between both. Mm, just a short glimpse through that. So the newest artwork I did was, it's called Shaky Savine and doing nothing with AI. And a violin player is improvising based on his perception, a modular music piece by Amir Sanayé. While being connected with my artwork and doing nothing with AI is trying to make the violin player activate his non-task brain network but the, while the violin player has this task of actually improvising. So there were like, in this case, there are two entities with contradicting aims and they somehow create this really beautiful dialogue of um, sensing the other, um, analyzing the sensor, sense of the data, but actually then acting and reacting.
when this was live performed for the first time, it was a very interesting experience because it was the first time I really felt what it meant that I decided to actually create an artwork where I only or very much try to define the targeted EEG feedback, but not the real choreography. So in the final rehearsal, we, it happened that the AI was only mo moving like very little and not a lot at all. And we were all really disappointed. And then during the performance, it went out really well. And it's, it's very interesting because it always evolves differently in different settings and with different perceivers. So it's really this kind of um, non-hierarchical interaction where both somehow try to learn something about the other and at the same time are also shaping the other. So within mind spaces, I try to think this concept further. So to also think about different feedback from the perceiver, think about different learning and interaction setups. But also I'm still trying to stick with this concept of doing nothing and non-task modes and how they are relating to our, our changing in parallel to digitalization. So with all this together, I am very much looking forward and yeah, thanks for having the chance to present today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. That's uh, really, uh, really interesting and uh, actually uh, very uh, totally into the subject. Uh, I, 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 will, uh, um, I have some, um, some comments or questions. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> did you wonder in terms of, um, in terms of uh, artwork behavior, uh, did you try to make a difference between what could be uh, a behavior of attention, uh, curiosity, and so on, and a behavior of expression, like uh, choreography, which is a uh, different. There are two. There could be two kind of behaviors. So that's a part, that's part of the question because I'm sure you you will have comments to do uh, at the same time. The the also it's not a question. It's a remark. I really appreciate what you do with a specific texture. Uh, and the work of the materiality of the sculpture because it, it produces itself the sound that you, yeah. you know the one you presented in Ars Electronica uh, and of mm -hmm. course the sound is so relevant it's exactly the sound is supposed to do and this is exactly what it does and mm -hmm. uh, um, and at the same time uh, you, you create something that could be aggressive and that becomes sensual and uh, I think this uh, aggressivity and serality uh, is interesting. It's, uh, it's probably uh, due uh, to some uh, plastical aesthetic choices you have done, including in colors, uh, because the work with colors works uh, very well, creating effects of moiré uh, that are uh, interesting as well. So it's not a porcupine. It's a... Uh, it's a, it's a living being. I, I know we had some exchange about this idea of art subject, and this is exactly what, what, uh, what it is about. So that's a very good, a very good example of uh, artworks that evolve on the, on the side of the living. Uh, thank you for your comments. Um, like, I think right in the beginning, I made this choice, choice to avoid this attention seeking. So I think I define the space of freedom or possibilities. And within this space, I set the rule that it should be fluent motion. So no peakless motion. Because otherwise, I, I really try to avoid this attention to keep someone looking for and keep someone interacting. Because I had this uh, experience when creating it, that is, Mm, it's somehow a living being, but once it's like uh, creating this attention, you have the feeling that you have experienced it as a as a whole, and you you're gonna leave it. But if it's like peakless interacting and behaving, I had this experience that the dialogue continues way longer and gives you more insight. 
Yeah, that, that, uh, what you're talking about is exactly the kind of choice and decision we have to take when we design the behavior as part of an artwork. And, yeah. and uh, the, the perception make, uh, gives the possibility to create a specific behavior and reveals by the behavior what is, uh, uh, how do you want this artwork to be expressive? Mm -hmm. uh, and and this, is, uh, this is really interesting. This is why the, the snake in front of the, the uh, flute player uh, has a, such a specific behavior. Uh, and and uh, we can imagine some other having, uh, let's say, animal-like behaviors or um, human-like uh, anthropomorphic behaviors. And we can avoid that as well. But this yeah, is true. where it becomes difficult. If it's not an animal, if it's in? not a human, yeah? Tyson, sorry, no, I did, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I just said I was wanted to jump in. I also, I, very similarly, I really enjoyed the, um, the presentation. So thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to say, I mean, you know, of course, as an architect, I'm also interested in space making and, and these kinds of kind of objects, dynamic objects becoming almost spatial objects, let's say, or something that you might inhabit. Um, and I think it's really interesting because like, there's a kind of push very much in our work and you'll see a bit of that in my presentation of this kind of like data-driven approach where we're in some sense optimizing for something or we're even optimizing for some sort of multi-objective uh, results that we're after. Um, mm -hmm. But I find it interesting when this kind of evolutionary process is not going towards, let's say, such a specific goal um, without this kind of disruption that you are, through your intervention that you're producing where you talked about it as kind of a co-evolutionary process um, and almost like when, you know, when it was, when the, the evolving of the creature was, or, you know, this, this kind of artificial creature was being driven most by people's thoughts or emotions. It was kind of just static almost. Um, I, I, there was something like that. There was a moment where it was more static. Um, and I think it's really interesting when you start to say, okay, now we're going to make this more radical intervention where the behavior is it's open game for design. Like we can really, we can really explore a lot of territory there rather than making the behavior, the results of the people around it. Actually, it's much more about the feedback um, of, that, of that behavior on people. And I, don't, I just thought it would be kind of interesting when you start to talk about specific behaviors um, and how, for example, you know, can this creature learn to kind of test, you know, test what, how people will react to its behavior. Right? So can it learn its own kind of inherent behaviors based on its own motives uh, rather than the motives of the people on the outside? Um, anyway, I, I, found, I found that that whole dialogue very interesting and I think uh, there's a lot of, a lot of territory to be, to be investigated there. This sounds like an excellent transition, Tyson. It's your turn. <laughs> oh, oh. No, sorry, sorry, oh, Emmanuel, perfect. did you want to, to reply something or to react? I think mm -hmm. I confused him with whatever I said. <laughs> no, no, I just wanted maybe to make it clear. It's, uh, it's like measuring the EG feedback, but it's not visualizing or translating. But sure. it somehow uses this database to learn behaviors and also generate new ones. I but see. it's true, okay. its only ambition is to mutate slightly and test mm -hmm. what's the feedback. But I would be very much interested also to use different kind of interaction and learning modes where it's not this slight mutation, but maybe it's a more, it's a different one. But yeah, I think it always has to go in line with the concept as well, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Somebody else uh, would like to say something because uh, the discussion is, uh, is open. Okay, so Tyson, it's your turn. Thank you, Emmanuel. Um, okay, my name is Tyson. Uh, I work as an associate researcher with Zaha Hadid Architects, so um, I'm, I'm existing more on the space making end of things. Um, so as a partner in Mind Spaces, um, so the title of my talk will be about cognitive agent-based life process modeling to predict social performance in workplace design. So I tried to basically write a sentence that explains what we're doing. Um, so I work as a part of uh, Zaha Hadid. It's a global team of about 400 people. Um, obviously mostly oriented towards developing buildings and architecture. Uh, specifically, our research team, uh, as part of Mindspaces, uh, we, we're, we call our work agent-based parametric semiology, which I'll talk about a bit more in a, in a moment. 
Um, and this is built on the pre uh, kind of preface of a kind of hypothesis around human behavior being interrelated with architectural space. So this is kind of belief that we are, we're, we're looking into and the relationship can be simulated and measured to predict social performance of architectural spaces. Um, so specifically in the Mindspaces project and in our work, uh, we've been looking at the workplace domain um, as a kind of target testing ground, but uh, obviously it's open to, to kind of using our work on other architectural spaces. Um, this image of course is exactly the opposite of what we're trying to do. So um, we're trying to move away from this kind of highly privatized and regular office design, um, looking more into contemporary office design, uh, which is more about this kind of dynamic ecosystem um, of, of people, um, of different working styles, um, of different collaborative modes. Um, so considering this workplaces of today um, start to look more like this. So they're more like um, a kind of multi multi-dimensional spaces, almost looking like a, an apartment um, or a living space offering different modes of, of work. Um, so specifically in, in our work, we're interested in trying to simulate collective human behavior um, and we, these are some of the things we want to heighten in the office design. So we're looking at casual social encounters uh, and effective unplanned collaboration as a big target goal. So many people today believe that uh, productivity in offices is, and obviously creativity is enhanced through the opportunities for collaboration. So we're trying to actually increase the probability of this and, um, and also to make those collaborations more effective. Um, so much of that comes through visual connectivity, spatial flexibility, um, as well as other kind of uh, objectives of offices seen below. Um, typically, uh, agent-based simulation tools have been used in, in design of buildings, but primarily for things like circulation and um, evacuation procedures. So in our case, we're building agents um, as a way of trying to simulate social behaviors um, and working behaviors. So what is our goal? Uh, we're building a cognitive agent-based model to simulate and analyze human behavior and social patterns directly in relation to the architectural environments that we design. We're trying to collect real-world data to collab calibrate that model by identifying productive social behavioral patterns in relation to real architectural spaces um, and to build a generative design framework by which we can, uh, in a data-driven manner, uh, increase uh, the, the qualities of our designs from a social point of view aligned with clients, uh, company cultures. So this is a kind of diagram showing that. So we have a kind of design model uh, and a simulation model which evaluates it. Um, and we're trying to feed empirical data, um, much of which is coming through our work in Mindspaces um, to try to calibrate that model. So specifically, I'll start with just explaining a bit our simulation model. Um, so basically this is built on three, three main parts. So we have a cognitive agent, which is essentially um, an individual, like a person, uh, which takes its own autonomous decisions uh, through a decision-making framework, which I'll explain. Um, the environment in which they interact with each other and in which they perform their tasks. Um, so a working environment is that's kind of our design environment. And then a data-driven data portion. So we're collecting data around surrounding the collective behaviors of people, where they happened, how they happened, um, and analyzing that data to try to understand how our spaces that we design can be improved from that point of view. Uh, so first, the cognitive agents. So essentially, each each agent um, is an encapsulated software object. It has all of this these parts of, of data inside of it. So it has a series of affiliations, its rank, its department, its teammates, its friends, um, which drive a lot of the decision making. Um, an internal state, which is dynamically changing. So its social state, its work state. So how motivated is it um, to, to work at a particular time? It has a perception visual perception, um, control mechanisms for finding paths between different locations and making those paths, and a de decision-making framework, um, which takes into account all of these contextual pieces of information, as well as their internal state in the environment to try to take individual decisions over time. Um, so first here, you see a bit about the perception. So this is just identifying that every agent, each person that's being simulated in our uh, simulation tool um, is constantly updating its perception, which has a partial effect on decisions that they make. So as these agents move through space, they start to see these kinds of three-dimensional uh, visual environments and then can dec decode what they see, who they see, um, and then making, make formulating decisions based on that in their internal state. Um, through these kinds of means, the collective 
agents, let's say, so a, crowd of lar a larger crowd of people, uh, we can collect all of this data and build up a visual mapping uh, three-dimensionally of what they saw over time. So what are the places they saw the most? Uh, which are the kind of avenues and visual connectivities that had the most effect on what they could see? So decision-making. Uh, here we looked deeply into many um, cognitive architecture frameworks um, that have been put together in the past. Um, and began to basically build our own. So for, for example, here, the, this is a well-known, the belief, desire, and intentions model um, for how people formulate their decision-making process and the influences upon it. Um, in our model, at any time, an agent's looking at its internal state, which is changing, its environmental state. So what does it see? Who is around it? What places can they inhabit or interact with? Um, and some of the other internal information, such as their work scheduling or um, their department or team. So here you see kind of visualization, just color coding the people based on different actions that they're performing at this particular frozen moment. Um, so each agent, depending on what their, um, their role is, let's say if they're a software designer or if they're a receptionist or if they're um, a director or something, they may have a slightly different set of potential actions that they perform. Um, and inside of their brain, let's call it, they have a series of actions which each one uh, takes into account different considerations, such as the distance to something or visual connection to something or internal state or the time of day. <clears throat> and these different pieces of information are being evaluated at each given moment in time to determine which action to take. So this is a kind of just quick visualization of that process kind of diagrammatically explained, let's say. So, each particular agent has a slightly di different set of internal parameters. And internal states. So here you see some of the internal state parameters, which do change iteratively over time. Um, as the agent moves through space, they're evaluating what they see. So who is around them? Do they know this person? Are they friends with this person? Are they in the same team with this person? Um, and what are the types of spaces they interact with? And how can they use them? So first, this is just showing some sort of scheduled meeting. Um, so we have kind of like hierarchy of decision making. So once this meeting has ended for this particular team, the agent is evaluating constantly its space around it, its environment, and then weighing the series of considerations. Should I go to work? Should I have a drink in the kitchen? It's chosen to go to the kitchen to have a drink and possibly a conversation. So now the environment, um, the agents are in interacting in this design environment. This is essentially the environment that we we make our design inter interventions in. Um, the environment contains the agents, of course, um, a series of destinations. These are interactable objects such as furniture, spaces, uh, rooms. Um, each agent knows how to interact with each one of these objects. Um, there are zones, so areas which are more for working or areas that are more private. And then there's events. So events are dynamic. We have scheduled events such as meetings, but then we also have things like encounters um, or conversations or collaborations. So here you see a bit kind of the destinations that we have. Each one is, a, again, a software object that the agents know how to interact with. Um, we have scheduled events. So each team, they know that the people that are composed in a team, they know when they have certain meetings they have to attend. So that's taken into account. But then we have unscheduled events such as encounters like this one. So we're, re we're really interested mostly in how we shape space, how we change the design of our spaces to try to actually predict and increase these kinds of events between people that should be interacting with each other to, protect, to increase the probability of productivity, let's say, um, and collaborations. So kind of those types of collaborations that you have at your desk or in kind of informal spaces, we're trying to orient where those spaces go in such a way that we can encourage people actually to have a place to have those, those interactions on a dynamic basis. And then finally, conversations, more social events. So quickly here, you'll see this is the environment. Um, again, just kind of identifying some of those features. So we have zones, such as working zones or social areas. Um, we have destinations which they interact with. And then events that start to take place, such as conversations or private meetings. So finally, then we have data. So the data that's produced by the model as well as the input data that um, produces the kind of overall crowd that we use to simulate. 
So as output data, we have asset data, of course, the quantity of assets and kind of efficiency of the designs of these spaces. Um, we have global quantities that come out. So how many encounters in total came uh, or how many conversations were, were produced? Which actions had the highest percentage of time? So for example, are we creating an office where everybody has to walk way too much? Or do we actually want people to walk because that's healthy for them? <laughs> so these kinds of things can be monitored and measured. Um, and then finally, spatial data is constantly being mapped over the space. Um, so we can see where things happen the most um, and which kinds of design features potentially are contributing to that. So each agent, as they move through space, is dropping a data point, um, which is giving information about the location, time, which agent produced the action, which action was produced there, and were there other participants in, in what happened. And then we can, we can convert that to kind of a visual mapping so we can understand spatially which, which zones, let's say, had the greatest influence. Uh, which places are most underutilized here, you see um, kind of a collective mapping over a sped up simulation over time. And as the environment has changed, we can start to visualize um, what, what did the agents see the most? Can we change kind of shaping of the three-dimensional environments um, to let's say increase privacy in certain areas, but decrease, uh, but increase visual connectivity in others? Um, so here you see a bit of a quick simulation trying to show this kind of over time on one of our design models. Um, so you see that the agents are dropping these data points over time, which is then producing a dynamic series of maps, of historical information. So for example, specifically, is there a map, we have a map that shows where everybody walks the most, where people talk the most, where collaborations happen the most, et cetera. So from there, we can compare our different designs in terms of these data-driven um, outcomes. Um, and we're, we're very interested now in, in integrating um, empirical data into our models. So some of the uh, studies we've done, we have uh, occupancy sensors set up in our office where we're trying to understand a little bit about where people go, how they behave in relation to features in the, in the environment, as well as looking at camera uh, camera vision, um, much much of what uh, Alexia showed earlier uh, would feed into our model to start to understand pairwise or individual behaviors in relation to the environment. Um, we're also doing surveys of the office to understand things like where do people do certain activities the most and for how long and with who. And then we're looking at Skype, uh, Skype data of our sort of social interactions in the office and trying to identify modularity, group subgroup types, certain people who find themselves um, at the cusp of communication between multiple groups. And then to try to feed that into our model by identifying, let's say, percentages of certain agent types, um, which are characterized very similarly to uh, the social network of that office. So finally, the last bit, um, then talking about design. So we look at design variables, such as the organization of these features in the environment, um, things like breakout spaces as attractors for people um, or circulation routes and how we can shape them or things like the geometry of the organization of our layouts. And then we analyze them iteratively to try to understand what is the relationship between these features and the outcomes. So here we, we were looking at a 2000 person floor plate um, running 2000 agents over that floor plate and then trying to identify in the design process, this is the concept design, um, how we can improve uh, the, let's say the social performance prediction. So here you see some of those outcomes and essentially we look at different options and compare them and then try to identify locations where we can adapt the design to try to increase things like the conversion of encounters to uh, collaborations, things like this. So to close, um, we're now trying to make this a more automated process um, where design simulation and analysis is in a kind of active feedback loop. Um, and we've developed a kind of generative design engine to try to produce the actual design configurations, which can then be simulated and evaluated. So this is showing this. So this basically a user uh, comes in and, and decides upon certain, let's say space planning organizational features um, or regimes that, that are typical to the kind of office culture that's being designed. 
So here we're using certain 120 degree desks, which has an, a certain influence over the overall spatial planning. Um, and then the second video that you see next, you see a kind of more rectilinear design. So our tool produces these designs, um, which can then be evaluated by our simulation tool, which you see in a moment, and then experienced in, in VR. Sorry, that was a bit long, but that's about just about the end. Okay, thank you very so here, much. So Tyler. here you can... Um, some comments, reaction, questions? Hello, yeah, yes, I, I have a, a comment because yes. uh, I, I have heard a news that uh, in London, one of the more important architects decide to leave the office in the building and all the people is going back to the uh, home, uh, home um, work. How, how, how do, do you think Hello. I hung on. We lost you. I think I understood. I think I understood the gist of this question. <laughs> yeah. I can't yeah. can't hear you, Alejandro. But I I think your question was about. Um, oh, maybe you're. Are you back? Yes, yes I'm back. Yes, I, I was oh, talking about the the current situation that I heard that mm -hmm. one of the big architects in London left the building, office that he has in the center of, of London. And uh, all the people is going to work from home. And my question is, uh, how, uh, from, from your research, are you evaluating this possibility also that the, the, the people goes back to home to work? Yes, yeah, so how, yeah, how, absolutely. How, how, how do you produce the interaction in, in this way, in virtual? Yeah. Sure. So I, the virtual interaction is another question that I can also tackle. But I would say, in general, from the point of view of my prediction of office spaces, certainly this whole, this whole situation that we're all faced with is having a large impact on the nature of what we think of as an office, the nature of how we think about work, collaboration. Um, I think on the one hand, yes, we need new models of, of looking at virtual interaction spaces. So uh, what you might have seen in the end video there where we're showing this kind of real-time um, visualization of these spaces in a more immersive context, we've looked into ways in which we can place actual people in those contexts and interact in different spaces. That being said, I think on the other hand, I think that the, the whole no nature of, of the situation is actually enhancing the, or increasing the need for collaboration. So I would say that office spaces, we've been asked to redesign, uh, even to redesign our own office spaces in, in London um, with the kind of COVID situation in mind. And I think that one, one thing that's come out of this is people realize that it's not a total disaster to work from home. It's not a total disaster. Like uh, work is still being done, um, you know, there, but there are certain tasks such as group collaboration, which really um, re don't require, but should have, let's say, more personal interaction. And I believe that actually we will now orient more towards designing offices for even more collaborative. And, you know, so many of the things that I spoke about earlier about trying to increase social interaction in offices, I think that will only be enhanced and office spaces will become even more oriented towards that and less about sitting in and working on focused work in a corner. Um, that being said, that means that, you know, we actually, the space planning of those, those places will change as well. Um, so I, I don't know if that exactly answers your question, but I believe that, um, that actually these things will only increase now. It just means that for a period of time, there will be less people in those spaces and those people that are there will be more oriented towards dynamic, collaborative and, and kind of meeting environments, perhaps enhanced by virtual environments as well. Yes, that, that hopefully that answers your question. Yep. <laughs> okay, I think, I think Hello, thank you. Thank you for your question. And Tyson, thank you for your great talk as usual. Yeah, I can, should I start? Um, yeah, 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 please. Yeah, you can share now. Yeah, no, let's not repeat the topic about 
why and how artworks feel. That's the general thing. I am Anastasia Stelis. I'm an associate professor at School of Architecture in Aristotle University in Thessaloniki. We are partners in in the project, and uh, I think I'm going to be a little bit more educational and academic. In, say, uh, so I'm going to take you back in uh, in history and show you and try to see how the ability of art and artworks and the ability to communicate and make sense about what they mean about the city. And I'm going to start with some really old images by Leonardo da Vinci and uh, the, uh, the Sfera Solida. So this, we can see the circular arrangement and these spherical views of the world and the cities that uh, really somehow look, made the perfect location for art in the cities. That would be the, the center of the circle, obviously. And yeah, we can see like in, uh, centuries ago how um, the location, the, 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 the artwork in the middle of, of, of the world, of the circular world, meant quite a lot um, about the cities. And this development um, has been reflecting control, and, let's say, power. Uh, over the city and uh, many more illustrations so from centuries ago show exactly that, that art has been somehow participating in uh, some you know, some meaningful participation of people you know, with the artworks and we can uh, go further on to see these kind of examples of, let's say, emblematic parts of the city. You know, these are cenotaphs, the famous one from Etienne Boulet from the 18th century. But in general, we see these uh, central location of art trying to control. And that has been, um, that's the first observation that I wanted to, to, to share today about the uh, meaning of, you know, of uh, artwork. And this has reached, you know, some sort of extremes at some point. You can see Jeremy Bentham's Panopticon um, that has been used, let's say, for uh, prison kind of uh, buildings. Um, that's more or less a first, let's say, uh, proposition that I would say that art and the city are somehow projecting schemes of power. But we can move on to more artful productions. That's uh, the Metropolis, the film from Fritz Lang from the beginning of last century, uh, speaking of, let's say, future cities and uh, somehow um, blurring the, the boundaries between architecture, power, and art, that, that uh, tower on the right. And um, we can see more, let's say, artworks, uh, quite progressive and quite innovative of that. Uh, era with like, ladies dancing uh, below you know, the roots of some weird organic um, construction, and then as well art uh, trying to um, to express the human intellect, uh, sentiments, and the needs of a whole say, era. That's Antonio Santelia's uh, drawings from you know from again from the beginning from last century and the, the Tatlin Towers, all again projecting somehow a social uh, vision and the social sentiment and let's say a need of uh, society to express itself and you know, show some sort of an ideal environment that has been going on in the next decade. We can see the Dish style, um, let's say, style that was actually based in art that it's called the Gemein, Gemeinsch Kunst in Dutch. And that's how the ritual joint was, let's say, invented by three streams of, let's say, human, let's say, activity uh, that are at the same time joining each other, but not stopping each other. That's the meaning of this kind of joint that really gave birth to a whole new trend for art and architecture and uh, city building. And that was artworks in the city as a social vision. And then we can move on to more artworks. We see you know, all this blurred uh, production between art and architecture, that's outdoor architecture, that's the entrance of the uh, Paris uh, 
Metro stations quite famous from McDonald and Dimar from again from the last century that is really trying to get people close to let's say some sort of natural element. I mean those resemble some sort of branches and tree like uh, structures that were quite new all the time. Plus those metabolists from the middle of the previous century that again they were trying to uh, see how let's say nature multiplies itself and how uh, human activity, human create creativity can actually use this kind of method and try to reproduce itself. That's more or less based on science that partly was there, but uh, the biggest part of those scientific, let's say, existence was uh, fictional, you know. There was no technology uh, able to support that, but there were some sort of speculations on uh, how Let's say architecture and art could uh, somehow follow nature and, 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 and uh, replicate these metabolistic, let's say, activity of nature. Plus, Fry Otto creating uh, these uh, series of building structures that are not purely architectural but are really close to, let's say, to artistic production. And again, he was trying to see how you know, liquids were. Um, you know, clothes, liquids were behaving, and this kind of dialogue between, let's say, a careful scientist, a careful observer, and natural effects like uh, the combination of, let's say, strings and liquid can give, let's say, form to new pieces of art and architecture and even structural systems. And some, let's say, funny things from the postmodern era, that's the 80s and last century. That again, the, the point is. What is shown here, it's this link to nature that has been feeding the production of art and the artworks uh, throughout uh, the cities of the world. Then we can move on to more kind of um, production that Frank Lloyd Wright uh, projecting um, some utopia of a city that uh, never existed and never existed and could never exist because it's employing some sort of weird technology that allows these kind of shapes to fly and allows this kind of uh, arrangement of architectural, structural, and artistic elements, you know, throughout some sort of urban environment that was completely invented by by him. And we can see more, let's say, the interaction between um, uh, people and inventive uh, that's Peter Cook and uh, Ron Heron and the famous archigram from the 60s. They were also coming up with um, new cities, future utopias that were based on um, what have been called or extremely artistic um, resemblances of uh, what everyday life could or would be again it's uh, speaking of technologies not there that were not there but technology that would somehow exist so these were some sort of speculations about let's say some sort of unknown future but the vehicle to go through to that toward that future has been art and its implication its employment you know to somehow develop these utopian worlds that's more like details from peter cook's uh, walking cities and that same climate, Constant Nivenhaus has been portraying um, more artwork, that uh, New Babylon project that has been going on for decades, and it has been suggesting a utopian uh, city, utopian urban life that would somehow float above the air. And it has a lot of uh, social implication uh, in itself. And um, that's a third or a fourth, um, let's say, thing that I would like to say that artwork in the city has been acting as, let's say, visualized utopias and trying to investigate potential technologies that uh, would be there or would be not there. And um, work in an artistic way, um, in a big degree liberated by all kinds of restraints that would otherwise be there. And we can move on to the end of the previous century. You can see, again, the same kind of activity, these artistic exploration of 
the city, um, but Dan Libeskind showing his universes in the late 70s. And these are, let's say, fragments of a city that has never been there. Uh, it, there was a lot of political discussion uh, involved in this kind of uh, artwork developed for the cities. Most of them are for Berlin, and they were somehow predicting of and predicting and following the events of the 80s in Berlin and Zaha Hadid, Tyson <laughs> uh, might know much more about that, but still in the early 80s and the Tick Club again, some kind of illustrations or you know, visual versions of, let's say, an artistic, uh, uh, of artistic character, but uh, with quite a strong, let's say, statement is a strong argument by Zaha Hadid that really made her famous, you know, while she was in her late 20s or early uh, 30s. And even more, let's say, combinations of what I call these cross-disciplinary stimuli that, let's say, all bring up to describe, let's say, architectural and artistic production of that area. That's again studio on the left and Kopf Himmelblau on the right and Neil Spiller with his communicating vessels. We can see the uh, artistic techniques that have been all selectively, you know, involved in this kind of uh, speculative design of um, these, let's say, experimentation. So that's the uh, fifth, let's say, the thing that I would say, the park and the city have been acting as lateral combinations of cross-disciplinary stimuli. I mean, that's quite a mature, let's say, era of um, doing things. And this has, let's say, fueled what we do at School of Architecture. That's more, let's say, an experimental agenda, um, and, um, real physical and design speculations that are really trying to work with let's say, available technologies, uh, work with, let's say, stimuli from all kinds of sources, and uh, at the same time using uh, the repertoire uh, familiar to art and artworks, that's some sort of structures that um, our students have been doing, and some sort of designs that used to be part of, let's say, student projects and diplomas, and speculations on elements of the city that are partly structural, partly architectural, partly artistic, and uh, small scale, let's say, arrangements, and, and, and uh, big scale, let's say, propositions that um, practically uh, blur the lines dividing art and architecture, but that's quite useful and quite necessary when uh, you know, uh, we are at the level of, let's say, speculating and material experiment, trying to see uh, trivial materials of the city and how they can be rearranged and, you know, and fabricate new things with those. And more, let's say, I'm scrolling through some images by Stephen's project, trying, to, as I say, to find sources and stimulation from, you know, from really different sources from different parts of the past and create more or less some sort of arrangements that can be architectural, structural, urban, but necessarily they are, let's say, artistic explorations that can fuel, let's say, a discussion about the role, let's say, of art and artworks in the city. And again, you know, big scale arrangements that are really based on quite new technologies available and the way they can help us you know, rewrite and rearrange urban blocks. That's more or less stuff that um, create, let's say, the theoretical background of what we are doing and what we're trying to say through the project that we are involved. And that's the last, let's say, proposition. The art book in the city is experimenting and speculating mechanism that's for, let's say, an academic activity happening, you know, at School of Architecture. So um, just to close and to see why and how art books feel, I think that, let's see, well, we can see those bullets that 
uh, talked before. Uh, there is this role assigned by cities to artworks as let's say projected schemes of power of social visions, links to natural environment, visualized utopias, lateral combinations of cross disciplinary stimuli and as experimenting and speculating mechanisms. Uh, that's and much more is what art and artworks <laughs> do in our cities and really help us understand the city and come to decisions that might change it afterwards and uh, this let's say kind of framework provides somehow a, a solid base you know where we can really use all these kind of new technologies and make them say, useful for you know the city and let's say people's life in those uh, that was uh, what I had to say, and I hope that was okay. Thank you. Thank you so yes, much for this invitation, Maurice. I think it's a very interesting thing that you're organizing this session, and I think it's a great opportunity within the uh, Mind Spaces Consortium to share some ideas that might not be as easy to share during the process of the uh, regularities of the uh, research project agenda. So thank you for organizing this. Um, I will uh, on this. Uh, I will uh, try and share with you some images of uh, a project uh, that um, relates with uh, mind spaces agenda and ideas in many ways. Uh, um, I am. Uh, uh, I'm teaching uh, architectural design and landscape at uh, International uh, Hellenic University and I joined the um, research unit in at Aristotle University uh, for a Mind Spaces project. So I'm going to share with you some images of this uh, project called Paradisical Samplings that somehow grew uh, a bit bigger than the academic agenda within the landscape architecture department that I was teaching. So allow me to uh, introduce my topic, Sensing Stillness from Landscape to Art. So I have been trained as an architect, but my playground is landscape. So what I'm going to be discussing with you today um, lies in three different uh, uh, parts. The first one has to do with some images, landscape images relating to um, ideas that uh, are deeply rooted in art and um, uh, interrelate to each other. Uh, so that I could create uh, the context for talking about uh, the project uh, Paradisical Samplings um, uh, in ways that it uh, has been formed and um, uh, grew. Uh, and finally, present some ideas of further um, uh, extending uh, this, uh, this project. So bear with me for a couple of slides that have to do with landscape architecture. Uh, uh, I have been dealing and researching on Central European and mostly um, Swiss landscape architects for quite uh, some time now. So I'm deeply interested in the way that art infiltrates the way we understand landscape. So uh, based on the theory of landscape architecture, which is a relatively new theory, uh, landscape doesn't mean much. It means very little, if not perceived as an experience. So mostly, uh, uh, the theory of landscape architecture has to do with our environmental perception of nature and landscape. So what we see here are some of the images that um, I've been re researched for quite a few years and maybe they give you an idea about the things that I'm, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, in the next few slides. So starting from uh, landscape and its uh, deep relations with art and uh, um, landscape as an experience and as an, a perception, human beings deeply uh, interact with nature and landscapes. So what we see in these images here are um, uh, a series by uh, Swiss uh, um, artist Letta Per and the ways that she's trying to um, visualize this stillness of this uh, remote Alpic, alpine environment, um, juxtaposed with images of uh, the glass house of Bruno Taut 
And uh, what I want to um, discuss with this uh, combination of images is the way that uh, landscape and natural environments lie as an eternal source of inspiration and uh, uh, continuous uh, playground and uh, interaction with, with human beings. So this phenomenal stillness, this um, uh, stillness that we can perceive through these images um, uh, in the sense that uh, they present no traumatic encounters. Uh, they can uh, tell us a lot about uh, a slow mode of interaction with, with the environment. So uh, many things that uh, we could talk about um, these images that I have selected for you today. But what I uh, would specifically like to, to, to focus on is the notion of uh, stillness. So out of this stillness, there are many things that um, uh, uh, someone could talk about. And uh, this project that um, I will try to uh, uh, discuss uh, in the next few slides has to do with uh, the ways that um, people perceive natural environments. So uh, a series of objects started uh, being formed uh, through the agenda of uh, a first year uh, landscape architecture studio. So in order to um, discuss with students what, uh, um, what landscape is and uh, how landscape could be perceived, they were asked to uh, create series of uh, small objects, series of um, uh, small uh, maquettes that they could uh, be made out of um, um, natural materials. So there is um, a, a slow and uh, really um, long interaction with uh, nature. And there are also all these uh, processes that really happening and uh, um, there are up to a point totally seamless. So um, discussing with students different and various uh, projects by artists and architects, this image here is from uh, an interesting uh, bio, uh, an interesting artist that was uh, primarily trained as um, in biology. So he created this image of um, uh, architect Miss Van der Rohe, uh, famous for his really clean cut interiors and very very austere architectural shapes uh, that um, creates uh, that uh, uh, creates a vision of a dirty future. So. Um, in, in some ways, a very deep uh, contradiction between a very austere and clean environment and the natural processes that we um, almost do not see. So what we have started um, playing with were images, natural images that uh, are evident of a very rich materiality. So what we um, actually uh, might perceive in, in nature as stillness, it, uh, um, almost, uh, um, it could reveal a, a very rich um, uh, mode of interaction with uh, different materials and different um, uh, qualities. So uh, students were initially asked to try and exclude qualities, exclude um, certain um, aspects of these um, uh, images and these environments and try to play with this material, not focusing on form itself but try and create a new um, a new object out of that so what we see in this slide is um, image of um, a river Rhine environment a small stream flowing through a, a valley in the um, in northern Greece and some of the um, explorations early explorations of, of students uh, materials that they have they have uh, tried to play with are uh, natural materials uh, such as soil, uh, clay, uh, wax, uh, seeds, uh, or anything. So these are um, uh, somewhere uh, most more in, uh, evolved. There are images of uh, a more of uh, um, states of objects that they that were created that are um, uh, more mature. So uh, students were playing with grasses, with grass, with uh, soil, with uh, um, st uh, materials of still nature and materials that are were um, uh, alive. Uh, they were playing with fabrics and uh, they were creating different layers of uh, leaves and uh, wool and other other um, materials that uh, you wouldn't imagine of. So. Up to a point, they were playing with uh, such ideas and such uh, materials, totally um, on, on a craft uh, level. And then we 
we try to um, get this project a, a, a stage up further on to try and move to a different um, uh, way of discussing about these forms. So uh, we came up with uh, some kind of additions to these objects that they were fabricated, trying to um, keep only a, a small part of these um, objects that uh, students uh, initially created. So some of these uh, objects, some of these uh, explorations were selected to be, expo to be exhibited uh, for an installation at the satellite program of um, um, Tallinn Architecture Biennale uh, two years back. And these are parts of our um, fabricated parts of the, of the models. So uh, this, uh, I won't um, go further into that. It's just um, a way of discussing about this um, uh, landscape perception, this, um, these models, these objects, that um, their um, intelligence may lie into, um, into the fact that they could both facilitate and witness landscape perceptions. So in the context of beauty, uh, they were uh, very interesting discussions about what you could take out from, from such um, experimentations. So uh, a, a very, very limited number of these um, objects were um, exhibited and you can see uh, top views of the actual uh, object and um, uh, the, the model of uh, the fabricated additions to, uh, to these uh, samplings. Uh, what we see here is uh, um, an object uh, created out of uh, wax that was inserted into the water, and uh, depending on the kinetic, um, on the on the movement of the water, uh, there were specific uh, forms that were created. Uh, some others uh, were um, uh, experimenting with uh, a combination of wax and uh, clay, and uh, they were trying to. Um, uh, uh, work and um, explore further the different substances, how they could work together. And uh, um, some of them, they either tried to uh, take the wax out of this uh, object afterwards by melting in it and try and see what other uh, formations could actually be. Um, and other materials, chemicals, such as those that uh, are used for the uh, molds to, to be created. This is a, um, a type of chemical that um, uh, gets crystallized immediately after you uh, pour into a specific uh, kind of uh, um, catalyst. So they were se there were seeds and leaves inserted into these uh, molds to create uh, these shapes. And uh, other um, objects such as this one that um, was out of um, soil and um, concrete. And um, some students uh, got even further trying to work with a sponge and um, corks and um, uh, layers of wax by treating in it or taking seeds apart and trying to create completely new uh, forms uh, out of uh, the same materials. And this is a photo of the installation in Tallinn with all um, nine models in place and their uh, fabricated additions in part. This is um, uh, an attempt to try and um, uh, discuss a bit further about this process of making and fabrication in order to see uh, where these two um, processes meet and how could someone um, uh, and what could come out of uh, these two different procedures coming coming together? It's uh, um, a brief presentation from DLA conference in uh, 2020, and I come to my um, last um, uh, uh, part of the presentation and um, images that uh, I'm sharing with you, trying to give you a, a, a small um, glimpse of uh, how we could uh, get this uh, project going on further. So we have focused a bit more on the um, wax material and tried to investigate not only the ways of um, um, it, of uh, how it takes shape as it is inserted in water. So what you see on uh, your left hand side is uh, a variety of models of um, uh, liquid wax inserted into cold water and uh, taking each its shape by the uh, movements of water into the tank. So we try to um, 
explore this process a bit further because um, I think that there is a very interesting moment where the liquid wax goes into the water. So by trying to film this process and um, see the, um, not only the um, uh, movement uh, of the liquid, but there's also, there's this uh, uh, very subtle moment that um, liquid gets, uh, becomes solid. And then we tried, uh, well, this is uh, actually completely in process. So we are trying to uh, experiment a bit on that and try to see, um, try to film the process and see uh, how these um, models uh, insert it into uh, the water and try to film this, um, uh, this process. So I think that this is my last image. Of course, there are many things to talk about, about, about the, the consistency of the walks, the movement of the water, the, 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 the exact temperature, and many, many things that we cannot get into uh, right now. So to summarize uh, uh, on the images that I have shared with you and this um, topic that I am very much interested in, uh, this notion of, of stillness, stillness uh, in the way that um, uh, it's not something that is completely uh, uh, unmovable, but um, a variety of, uh, of um, perceptional modes that could get, get into this, uh, this notion. So all these objects and the way that we are trying to discuss about it and take it a bit further have to do with uh, um, ideas and notions of landscape as a terrain of interaction between um, um, human and uh, environment and uh, these objects may stand into this uh, line of thinking not as bizarre um, bizarre things but they are trying to create a narrative uh, of a sentience of uh, landscape uh, and our perception of it i hope this all made sense for you and contributed to the title that maurice chose for this session thank you very much Thank you, Despoina. Uh, I think it's interesting because you took the, um, the topic in a very different way. Something like uh, a form of sensitivity and responsiveness of matter uh, reacting to the environment, which is a, a totally different approach, but uh, interesting. Okay, thank you again, uh, Maurice, for inviting me to Hong Kong throw this uh, opportunity that I hope you had a nice trip. <laughs> yes. Uh, okay. I'm going to introduce quickly uh, my institution, Lemongrass Communication, has a project uh, that is an institute for art and culture, Sprung Theda, that works in the interdisciplinarity. My, uh, my presentation is about how art thinking, how artists could make uh, big influences in what is happening in in the innovation and in the technology and in our uh, project that the, we are working with three three concepts that is art ethics and emotion and we are uh, trying to um, understand the social societal needs and to apply them to three use cases that are expanding cities, sparing workplaces, uh, functional home interiors. I think uh, what the, the, the most important is uh, understanding what is our thinking. I, I think a good definition is what uh, Hideaki Ogawa, that is uh, running this uh, the art thinking a school in Ars Electronica says that art thinking is not a methodology, but it's an attitude. We're connecting the project with uh, the international art world. That means that for uh, we are, were involved in the open call, uh, uh, recruiting professional jury. And between this professional jury, we invited uh, very uh, important uh, persons like uh, Catherine David, that is the deputy director of uh, the Centre Pompidou, and Pedro Gadanjo, that was director in MIT uh, Lisbon, but also the cultural advisor uh, uh, and the curatorial advisor in a very great exhibition that was mixing 
architect and art uh, last year in Whitechapel Gallery. Finally, uh, we are trying to understand why uh, art is interesting for the technological innovation uh, development. And I think the art thinking help us to, uh, to continue to be curious about the human and the nature and envisioning new worlds and making good questions that bring uh, bring us to new realities and visions that produce needs for new sciences and technologies. I put here a, a photography of an artwork that was exhibited in, in the last Venice Biennale that is from the uh, Chinese artist Sun Juan and Pen Yu that uh, was a robot that con is continually collecting a fluid in, in the floor that span, uh, span again and again. And the, the meaning of this work is the artist wants to represent what is art. That is, art always is refusing to be f fixed in a place. Finally, uh, we uh, throw our, our um, project, we are trying to create environments that the users could uh, we choose that they are citizens, offices, workers, and elderly people, we want to uh, be, uh, produce that they became co-creators using different tools and strategies that developed my, my space consortium. And I, one way that we want to do that is using the virtual reality that uh, make the possibility to uh, have a quick feedback about this environment that we are proposing by the suggestion of the architects of the artists. And finally, I think it's what is important in this project is we are bridging real and virtual and the motion and the functionality. This is also a great, great challenge. And also driven by our thinking that Make, uh, make us to do always the good questions and to per perceive the reality in, in other manners. Conclusions. The conclusions that uh, we could take is uh, Money Space is a very interdisciplinary consortium in, he, in his concept and in his uh, partnership between artists, architects, cultural managers, engineers, and scientists. And also is creating an ecosystem of research and innovation Understanding the great potential of art, we could create not only artworks because we are now think, uh, more talking about creating processes. Okay, thank you, Arihono, for having compacted uh, your, your talk uh, um, that is a bit sliced. Uh, uh, but um, yeah, I think we are done. So uh, I would like to thank, thanks every, and to thank everybody uh, a lot for your contribution. This has been decided a bit, a bit late. I know it was difficult, uh, but uh, it's interesting to have put together all this. And of course, the recording will be online, uh, at least uh, uh, at least on a, on. A, the Hong Kong Garden, but maybe and probably also on the Thessaloniki Mind Spaces Garden. Uh, anyway, it will be a link, and the link will be, of course, also relayed by Ars Electronica on, on the main uh, Ars Electronica website. Do you want to to say something to conclude? Thank you very much, Maurice. Uh, <laughs> thanks for or no, I know. Thanks very much for organizing. I just no, but I just wanted to say um, it's very I mean, one, at least for me in general, like the, the entire mind spaces experience thus far, and and also obviously today, it's very, it's been very inspiring and interesting to see the absolute diversity and scale and view of all the partners, which is um, you know it's really interesting and complementary upon the whole program. 
So I think, um, you know, the nature of the questions that we, we tend to have are so diverse. Um, it's, it's really, I think the essence of what I understand the starts program to be about, which is to kind of infuse the normal discussions with completely different lines of thought, um, inspired, especially by art artists, um, but also people from the scientific community also influencing the, the nature of, of artist thinking. So I think um, that's been very interesting. So thanks a lot for including me today. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, thank you to the, the team, the third team, Nefeli, that helped a lot. Uh, and uh, you've seen briefly Charlie uh, that had all the help also to uh, put that together.